Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to Inside the Writer's Studio, the podcast where we talk with writers about their lives, their craft, their business, and their latest work. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett, and our podcast is sponsored by Bookmarks. Bookmarks is a literary nonprofit whose programs include the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas. Come visit Bookmarks at our community gathering space and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Inside the Writer Studio is also proud to be an affiliate of Libro FM, the audio book platform that supports your local independent bookstore. Stay tuned at the end of the podcast for more information on Libro FM and a special offer. My guest today is Brad Meltzer, who is here today to talk about his nonfiction book, The Nazi Conspiracy. Brad, welcome to Inside the Writer Studio. So happy to be here. So you write both fiction and nonfiction, and and I feel like to, to some extent, at least there's a little bit of crossover in theme, if you will. You have books from both categories that to me feel kind of like thrillers. Um, what's what's the relationship in your writing life between your novels and your nonfiction? You know, I, I think, Charlie, if I'm being honest, I, I wish I had a grand plan that I said, I know exactly what I'm doing and this is my plan. Uh, I, I think I just have a short attention span. That's <laughs> probably why I write thrillers. That's why I write short chapters. And um, when I started writing, I wrote thrillers because I read thrillers and loved them. And then I had kids and I said, you know, I want to write books for my kids. So I'll write some kids books. And then I would I found I remember the secret plot to kill George Washington, a true story that really happened in the Revolutionary War. And I said to my editor, um, I, I kind of want to try nonfiction. There's no book in modern time written about this subject. And my editor said, I'm not interested in a book like that. So I went and found a different publisher and said, I'd like to try. And they let me try. So that is all to say, um, they all revolve around my same themes that I deal with. They always revolve around regular, ordinary people. Um, I believe ordinary people change the world. I don't care where you went to school. I don't care how much money you make. That's nonsense to me. I believe in the power of a regular person. And so that runs through all of them just because it's the only, it, it's my core belief. But other than that, I think it's, it's no different than if I said, Charlie, what kind of movies do you like for the you know, best? And you said to me, independent films. And I said, great, you're going to, you can only watch independent films for the rest of your life. Um, you, you would soon hate them. And, and for me, I just, I like having the ability to kind of mix it up and do fiction and do nonfiction. Yeah. I love what you say about ordinary people. I, I can remember I, I, my most recent novel is a thriller. And I, when I looked back at it and thought, okay, why did I, what about this do I think is the thriller? I remember this thing that our, my high school film studies teacher told us about Alfred Hitchcock. And he said he liked to make movies about ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. Um, do you feel that that, that what is it about the extraordinary circumstance that, that reveals the real character of, of ordinary people? You know, I guess, I, you know, someone said to me, they were reading the Nazi conspiracy and they said, you know, you read some history books and they're full of like, you know, grand themes and lots of dates and, you know, change was in the air. And I, and they said, you know, your books are different than that. They read like a thriller. And, you know, how do you why do you do that? And I, and I I'm not joking. I had to think about it for two days. And I finally realized it's just how I see the world. I don't look at it from a Hitchcockian point where I. You know, there is a Hitchcock quote I keep on my desk and it says, you know, paraphrasing, it's not the bang that's scary. It's the anticipation of it. I, I believe in that one. But when it comes to my belief about people, I just don't I don't believe in grand themes. I don't believe World War Two happens because changes in the air or magical things like that. I believe in, you know, regular ordinary people are doing all this work. And um, and I, I think it's just my worldview. It's not it's not anything more than that. It's not it's not a choice to make the thriller better or worse. It's just how I see the world happening. And, I, you know, I, I've gone to the White House multiple times. And when I'm there, yes, you see the president, but you see all these people that you never heard of who have these hands in history in that moment. And they're doing things behind the scenes you're never going to know about. And boy, are those the more interesting stories to me. There's, yeah. you know, when the president signs a pen, signs a, a law, he has the magical pen, you know, that he signs with. And then he he takes that pen. And I remember going to the White House once and they said, there's a guy who brings the pens and they bring extra pens because they give extra pens to the congressman because they all want to brag that they got the pen. And I just was like, I'm more interested in the guy who brings the pens and knows all the president's friends than I am about the actual law. And that's the better story to me every time. Yeah. Yeah. So you've written you, you mentioned about the um, what the, your book, The First Conspiracy, about the, the George Washington conspiracy, you wrote The Lincoln Conspiracy. 
The new one is the Nazi conspiracy. Tell tell us a little bit about the new book and and how you first found out about this particular story. Yeah, you know, I don't, Charlie, I don't believe that the internet is good for many things, but I, <laughs> I, I but sometimes the algorithm nails you, and and my algorithm is full of obscure historical nonsense because it's what I love, and I, I found this story years ago. Uh, it was it was not even a story. It was like a tiny little mention. It was like a half page page. Didn't even have many facts. It just said there was a secret plot by the Nazis at the height of World War II to kill Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill. And I was like, what's that? You know, how do we do like, why do I not know that story? And <laughs> it's a true story. What happens is um, in 1943, you see that uh, it's the moment where the Nazis are crushing it in the Soviet Union. Stalin is getting devastated. He wants us to invade. He's like, he knows he needs our help. We're sending weapons, but he wants more. He wants basically what's going to become the invasion of Normandy. And they realize we got to get the big three, the United States, the UK, and the Soviet Union on the same page. Millions of lives are at stake. This meeting has to take place. And it's in Tehran, Iran, of all places. And, and it's amazing because... FDR's motorcade comes to town. They bring the cars coming down the center of the city and everyone's craning their neck to peer into the car. President's waving back from inside. They all want to see the president. But what no one knows is the person inside is not the president. It's a Secret Service decoy. The real FDR is across the city, ducked down and hiding in the back of a beat up sedan because they're worried that there's a Nazi assassin about to kill him. And I just ruined chapter one of the Nazi conspiracy, but that's 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 chapter one. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such a powerful image to begin with. Um, and and that was something I wanted to ask you about is how, how you know you discover these historical stories. You are you are working with um, with things that really happened, but you still have to decide where you're going to start. How how did you land on that image? The image of the president of the United States in a beat up car on a back street, crouching in the back seat uh, as sort of the image that was going to pull the reader into and represent this story you're about to present. Yeah. You know, there's a Elmore Leonard had a great line about writing. He said, if you want to write a good book, you got to leave out all the parts that people skip. <laughs> and I, I, I always trans, I, you know, he was, I loved him and, you know, may rest in peace. I always took that to mean, just keep the cool parts, you, yeah. you know, and and when I write history, I, I don't want to read an encyclopedia entry. I don't want to hear, you know, on this date, on this happened, there were this many, this and this. I'm like, oh, gosh, it's just like reading the, the Britannica entry um, to me. I, I this is where my thriller side of my brain comes in. And and again, a beautiful way to like, take us back to it, it. It's not the bang that's scary. It's the anticipation of it. And when you think of the the movie, the tech movie titanic james cameron's original titanic we all knew the end of titanic yeah you know the ship's going down and i remember going to the movie i know it's so famous now these great scenes and blah 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 but i remember going to the scene and being like i know the ending how can it possibly be good and then james cameron does this brilliant thing where right at the very beginning of the movie he shows you this model of how they think the titanic sunk in the present day and they show you that it bobs down and then it comes back up and then it cracks in half. And that's when the real problems start. And all you're doing from that moment is just waiting for that bomb to explode. Yeah. And that's where, you know, Josh and I, when we were talking about the book, we knew the president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is hiding at the height of World War II in the backseat of a car. Like, what is happening? The promise to the reader is you're going to find out who he's hiding from. You're going to find out what they're doing. You're going to find out what he's up to. And to me, that was the bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you this kind of leads me into my next question, which is, um, you know, as you said, a lot of history books are are dense with detail and dates and and, you know, information that it's hard for a reader to absorb with long chapters and endless footnotes. Your your books have short chapters. Each chapter has a focus. Each chapter contains an amount of information that I'm like capable of of ingesting and comprehending. Um, you know, before I, before I kind of reach mental, you know, Capacity. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, I just wanted, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your idea of structure and how, how structure contributes to, to the kind of storytelling that you want to do. Yeah. You know, it's funny. There was uh years ago, I mean, it's like 20 years ago. I remember there was a book that 
someone said was the great book on writing story, truly called story, you know, by the great screenwriters himself. And, and I said, I never want to read that book. And he said, why? And I said, I, I know now, of course, over time that, you know, most thrillers or most books or most movies or most TV shows you watch have a three act structure, maybe a four act structure, but there's a three act structure. There's a beginning, middle and end. And I know that that's how it works, but I never, ever, Charlie, I never think about it. I just go with my gut and I just go with what do I want to read? And I trust my gut is right. Cause I feel like if I don't do that and I actually think about structure, I'm going to start doing some cookie cutter nonsense. And you know, when you read an author's first book and it was so good and it just moved at lightning and then you read their 10th book and you're like, yeah, I like the early ones better. The reason is, is because the author's fallen into their own traps and they're just repeating their own tricks and they're just, you know, following their own pattern that worked for them. And I never want to be that guy. So I don't have a, you know, when it comes to like how we structure it that way and, and how we broke it up, it's just how I like to read. I don't, I want to read a short chapter. I want to digest it. It's all I can digest. And thankfully, Josh is the same way. I think what you're seeing in the books, you know, Josh Mench, my co-writer on this book, I met him doing a TV show together and we both come, you know, he comes from TVs. I come from thrillers and here we are doing history. And obviously his shows are on the history channel and PBS and amazing places that do history. But what you're seeing is a perfect merger of his incredible research and, and my, um, my thriller writing. And that's how my thrillers are. It's even how the kids books are, you know, here's, here's the best moment, right? I'll give you an example. There's a guy in the book named Otto Scorzeni and he's a Nazi and Otto Scorzeni is a page to come to Hitler's secret headquarters, the wolf slayer. And Otto Skorzeny is a special operations fighter. Hitler's bringing together all the special operations guys, and he wants them to all come because uh, he wants to figure out who the best fighter is. He, you know, that's what he wants to know. He lines them all up in a big room, shoulder to shoulder, and he gives them a test with one question. The question is, what do you think of Italy? And they all start kissing the boss's rear end, saying, oh, you know, we stand with Italy. We stand strong. They're with us in this war. We'll fight to the death with them. We love them. And Otto scores and he shouts above everybody else. I am from Austria, my Fuhrer. He knows that Adolf Hitler's from Austria and he's gambling and knows that any true Austrian has a deep resentment for Italy because during World War I, Italy took a key piece of Austria and never brought it back. And in that moment, Adolf Hitler turns to Otto Skorzeny and says, you're my guy. I need you for a secret mission. And some people would say, great, now tell me the next part. And you know what my brain does? cliffhanger chapter end we're done yeah, yeah. It, it will never go further than that and then i'll give you something else i'll show you something else that's happened in the fdr i'll show you something that's happened in winston churchill and then we'll come back and you'll see the secret mission that hitler puts him on it's the craziest secret mission you've ever seen in your life um but when josh you know when, when we write a chapter and he's like let's tell him now i'm always like no 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 <laughs> you, when you get to the best part don't speed up slow down well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Otto because he, like a lot of other characters in this book, I mean, there's characters in this book that that we all know from from our history class, Stalin and and Churchill and Roosevelt in particular, um, and others as well. But there's also others like Otto um, Skorzeny, who I think most of your readers are, probably have never heard of. And, I had never heard of him. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, this, I, I kind of love, I'm seeing more and more of these books that sort of fall into the category of things you never learned in history class, which I really enjoy. Um, but obviously the more obscure a story is, the more difficult it is to to discover that story. T tell us a little bit about the the research process for for the Nazi conspiracy. Yeah, you know, it takes um, it takes a long time, you know, you because we're telling stories and nobody knows the when we did the first conspiracy about the secret plot to kill George Washington. I went to this Pulitzer Prize winning historian. I said, you know, is this story true? Is it really? He's like, you know, I'm, I've seen that in footnotes. He's like, but Brad, no one in modern time has written about that. Mm. So either you're going to go on this adventure and find out that it's not true and you'll have an adventure, or you're going to go on this adventure and find out it is true and you're going to have a hell of a book. Yeah. And I said to him, well, I like adventure. And we went on it and it was, you know, this unbelievable story that was all true. Uh, and and it just realized, you know, I, I don't I don't think of it about a genre. Again, I just think about what I you know what it is. Charlie? I, I know one thing. I'm not that special. And if I think this story is badass and cool, then I'm going to basically tell myself that there are probably 
thousands of people out there who hopefully think the same thing. Yeah. And, and that's all it is. It's just knowing that if, you know, again, find the best parts. And, and when you find the research for this, it takes us a year minimum of research. And, and unlike the Lincoln book or the George Washington book that we've done with the plots against them, this is a book where we, it's not just the National Archives. It's not just the New York Historical Society. We had to find researchers who speak Russian, who speak German. And, you know, the, the, the Nazis were, of course, famously, you know, tried to keep everything secret. They, they used to keep their top secret intelligence on what they call brown sheets, which were named that because they were literally dark brown sheets of paper. And you were supposed to, when you got the brown sheet, you're supposed to destroy it after 30 days. It was like the Mission Impossible briefcase for Nazis. And one of the things that we found was that the head of propaganda for the Nazis, Joseph Goebbels, would basically keep really intense diaries, really meticulous diaries. And he'd write down in his diaries very stupidly all the things he would read in the brown sheets. So that's how we got to figure out that they had cracked the codes in the United States, that the Nazis had cracked international cables and knew what FDR and Churchill were saying to each other. I'm so much more interested in the fact and how they cracked it and, and how they hid it from us and how they kept us from knowing. And I even am in terms of what, I mean, and so from the research, you know, when you hear a story like that, you're like, we need a new chapter. We need to do that. And we make that story part of the actual story of the book. Yeah. I mean, one of the, this sort of reminds me, one of the things I have become so fascinated by, and this is my, my most recent novel, the Enigma affair kind of focuses on some of the things that happened at Bletchley park, but there was this, the fact that, that, in in school, at least people of my generation in school, when we learned about World War II, we learned about a, a military engagement. And yet now we're starting to see that there was this entire other war, this entire non-military war um, that was being fought. And it, you know, it feels like that this book kind of falls into that category of what was going on that wasn't on the battlefield. Yeah, listen, I... Um... I firmly agree with that. I think we as Americans tell a very military focused story that is basically summed up like this about World War II. We punched the Nazis in the jaw. We saved the day for democracy and we won. Great story, um, but it doesn't scratch the surface. You know, it was not a foregone conclusion that we were going to win World War II. And when you see the alliance between Churchill and Stalin and Roosevelt in the Nazi conspiracy, you see how precarious it was. And when I look, I've now studied and written a book about George Washington, one about Abraham Lincoln. Here we are with FDR. When you, if you say, you know, who are the best presidents, when we think of the best presidents that everyone agrees on, regardless of your politics, it's not the president who makes the best speech. It's not the president who makes the best promises. It's the president who, when a disaster strikes, they can pivot and be the right person at that moment in time and deal with it. And that's why we all agree Lincoln's the best. That's why we all agree that George Washington's the best. And, and for me, FDR in this tour, it's not about how many people landed on Normandy. It's about the fact that the only reason Normandy happened is because FDR fully believed in one thing, the strength of his own charm. He believed that he, that he could charm Joseph Stalin, the uncharmable, you know, man of steel himself was his nickname. And that he, he's like, Stalin likes me better than you, Churchill. I got Stalin. And he believed and knew that he could charm Winston Churchill because Churchill liked him better than he liked Stalin. And you know what? FDR is right. And when you see the, these personalities play out, it, it's like they're kids in a, in a high school. You know, we tell stories about them like they're these monumental figures, but they're human beings. And they're, you know, petty and they're proud and they're amazing and they're awful. And like all of us, we are all those things. And I love being able to really be a fly on the wall and watch the moments where they're really doubting themselves or convinced that they're the one who can save the day. That that's just human to me. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, we you talk about um, some events of history that most of us haven't heard about, but this book also has chapters that cover events of history that, that we know all about, or we think we know all about. Um, and near the beginning, you have, a, you have a chapter um, that's the attack on Pearl Harbor, but, it's not necessarily told from the same point of view as what we're used to. Oh, can you talk a little bit about how you use point of view to, to give us a different path through what we might think is a familiar story? Yeah, this is full credit to Josh Mench, my co-writer. This was his idea, 100%. Um, so you, when you read it, and I don't, it's okay. It's like chapter two or three of the book. 
but you see these men at the crack of dawn, you know, going to their planes and, you know, racing. And there's, you know, this big disaster coming and getting ready for the air fight. And you're like, oh, here's Pearl Harbor. You can see it on the date. You can see December 7th. That's what the heading says of the chapter. And you're like, okay, I know this story. I know Pearl Harbor. But then we don't use any names. We just tell you this pilot's going this way and this pilot's going that way to his plane. And then as we slowly kind of pull out a little more, you realize you're not watching Americans. You're watching the Japanese. You're watching Pearl Harbor from the Japanese perspective. You're watching them wake up even earlier than we are and going in the middle of the night to bomb us, of course, at the, you know that famous day. And it is chilling to me when you take something that we all know so well and you switch the point of view and see it in a brand new way. And, and to me, it, it's the challenge. It's not just, oh, that's going to make it cool for you. The reality is you've seen the Pearl Harbor story 5,000 times. You've seen it told a billion times. You watched the storming in Normandy when you watched, you know, the Spielberg movie Saving Private Ryan. You've seen these things. We've been fed World War II stories. World War II isn't an event only in, in the United States. It's an ideal. It's the moment where we stood up to evil and we won. And so we've seen these stories a billion times. If, and and I, don't, I have no interest in telling you something you've seen before. So every time we do something you've seen, we're going to find something new or we're not going to do it. Um, I think, you know, hand in hand with the way you use point of view and the structure that we talked about with the, the shorter chapters, the cliffhangers, the moving from one thing to another, um, is the is the attention to voice. Unlike in a lot of history books, there are places here where I feel like we're just sitting around a fire and you're telling me a story. Um, can you can you talk about the use of voice in in nonfiction and, and whether or not writing fiction helps you sort of develop that voice? I don't think we could write this book if, unless I wrote 12 thrillers, 13 thrillers before that. Um, you know, one of the things I learned, and it's not just voice, but it's also tense. Um, we yeah. purposefully employ a present tense in telling the story. And, and I just think, why? Because if, if I tell you, you know, FDR on this day was scared, you're like, okay, he was scared, but I know what happened. He's fine. But if I tell you FDR is scared, there's immediacy to it. There's a moment where you're like, what's going on? And here comes the killer, as opposed to like, he thinks the killer is coming. That I know it's a subtle point, but especially on your show, where it's obviously so focused on, on you know, the writing process itself, that, that tense shift is a very conscious choice by us to give you an immediacy that makes it feel like this is not old history. This is something happening right now. And when we start each book, we always say, you know, the plot to kill Churchill and Stalin and, and FDR is the titillating thing we tell you to, you know, when you pick up the book for, but we always say, what's the book really about? What's it really, really about? And what we, and what we believe is this book is about the rise of authoritarians and fighting Nazis in the current time today. And so we want it to have an immediacy. So you can immediately go, Oh my gosh, this is, this feels just like today. World War II is not that long ago. And Frank and Barbara Walters were born in the same year. It's not that long ago. Yeah. And, and one of the things that really um, drives home for me is that this, you know, this book is set in this very brief period of the 20th century when the United States and the Soviet Union were officially allies. Um, but clearly you can sort of see them already, both of these superpowers, thinking ahead about what the map of Europe is going to look like. Um, how do you how do you see the conflicts and the chess games of World War II still still playing out today. Listen, we um, when Charlottesville happened and Nazis were marching in Charlottesville, when Kanye West opens his mouth and says anti-Semitic things, we all wring our hands and we all know, you know, we say, I can't believe this is happening in America. How is this happening here? This seems like something that should happen long ago or in Germany or Europe. And when we were researching the book, we found this Nazi rally that took place in Madison Square Garden in World yeah. War II. Yeah. 20,000 Nazis in the heart of New York City in Madison Square Garden, not there for an, a New York Knicks game, but to cheer. There's a giant banner of George Washington surrounded by swastikas. And the first speaker of the rally says, if George Washington were alive today, he would be friends with Adolf Hitler. And we consciously put that moment in the book because we want you to feel that's what the book's about again is to see and make that tie between those moments that it wasn't that long ago and if you don't learn your history 
you're going to repeat it. Um, and so for me, you know, as we, as we think about World War II, as we think about these things, I always am I'm trying to kind of keep, you know, just telling you old history is, is not interesting. History is only interesting if it informs something about today. And, it, and that's how I feel about story. I think, you know, your favorite books in your life, you don't love them because, oh, that plot's good. What you love them is because they tell you something about you. Your favorite books reveal something to yourself about you or something you aspire to be. And that's what World War II does. It shows us our aspirations, how we can be stronger, how we can use our voice. And when you see, you know, World War II happens because you have this authoritarian figure, you have these native born white Germans who are pointing to this other group and saying, those people, those people are the cause of our problems. And Charlie, that's a code, right? Those people, we sometimes that those people, be, you know, the black community, the Jewish community, of course, in the Holocaust, the gay community, the immigrant community, pick your community. But throughout decade after decade, you see it. And to me, you know, when we talk about World War II, we're not talking about World War II only. We're talking about anyone who sees someone being picked on. Use your voice and speak up and say enough. Yeah, I feel like these days when when people use terms like Nazism, they get accused of of exaggerating the situation. Um, but I, I think back to, I, I wrote about half of a play one time, I never finished it, about a prison psychiatrist in Nuremberg um, who, who examined all of the, the Nazis uh, who were there to, to go on trial after the war. And he came back to America and he said, look, you've seen years of propaganda saying that the reason these people are doing all this stuff is because they're crazy. And I'm here to tell you, they're not crazy. They're really sane and they're really smart. And people just wouldn't listen to him. How do you, how do you get people to listen and to understand, to, to not dismiss things by saying, that was a long time ago, that could never happen again. How do we tell the story of, of the Third Reich in a way that people won't say, oh no, that, I'm not going to listen to that. That's that's an exaggeration. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, for us, I can tell you what we did. And I think you're right. I think if you just point around and every person that annoys you, you say Nazi, if, uh, you, you know, first of all, it's not true. And second of all, that's ridiculous. Yeah. But there are Nazis that were marching in Charlottesville. Those were Nazis. Make no mistake. Right. I mean, you are. You know, some of those guys are Nazis. They are. They're wearing swastikas on their arms. They're saying Jews will not replace us. So, you know, I, I don't want to split hairs here, but sometimes there are real Nazis. Yeah. But for us to, to answer your question directly, how do you how do you teach that? You don't simplify it. I think the problem that we do with World War II is we simplify. We say, we say Adolf Hitler did this, you know, as if it's one guy. And one of the moments of the book that I'm so proud we have in there is a, a conference called the Wannsee Conference. It's a boring government meeting outside of Berlin, the beginning of World War II. And it's like any government meeting anywhere in the world. You, you know, you have these bureaucrats come in, there's a big giant conference table. Everyone has like a little file folder. They take a pencil from the pencil cup. They sit around the boardroom table. You think they're pe planning something as you know mundane as what roads should be paved that day, like it's any other Thursday. But on this particular Thursday, they're counting Jews in different villages. And they're deciding efficient ways to murder them all. And the thing that we point out in the book is you can't just blame Adolf Hitler. There were thousands of government employees who looked at all the plans and looked at all the things that they were putting in motion, and none of them said anything. None of them did anything. They all went along with it. And to me, when you bring it down, again, it's almost like where we started. When you bring it down to that human level, instead of just pointing out, you know, Hitler's the bad guy and we're the good guys, but breaking it down to like how many people had to go along with something this big before it happened and showing you the individual person who led that meeting and the people who sat with their pencil cups. Um, now it's not an abstract thing, but it's a real thing. And I, and I hope in those moments you realize, wait a minute. Yeah, when I see that happen, I need to use my voice and say enough. Well, you've talked. To, you've mentioned um, Josh Mench, your co-writer. Some tell tell us. I, I've I've talked to several writers um, who who work in teams over the years on the podcast. Tell us a little bit about how that relationship works, um, both in terms of researching and writing, and just how, how two people come together to create a book. Yeah, you know. So obviously, my thrillers I do myself. I have an editor, 
the, the nonfiction books like The Nazi Conspiracy, I, I physically couldn't do them without the research help. I, I just physically, there's just too much work to, to, for one person to do that and to do the thriller. And, you know, Josh had never written a book before in his life. He was the, um, the executive producer and head writer of our TV show. And I remember, you know, whenever we would do these TV shows for the History Channel, they, you know, they always give me some kind of script to follow. And then because I'm a writer, I always rewrite it. Yeah. And the set and the first episode, they give me the script and I'm like, fine, thank you. And I'm going to rewrite the whole thing right now, but I'll, you know, I'll give it back to you. And I do, I rewrite it and put in my voice. But then I'll never forget the second script came back for Lost History. It's a show we used to help find the 9-11 flag, the missing flag that the firefighters raised at ground zero in that famous photograph. The first episode was about that flag and we got to find it and bring it back, unveiled it in the 9-11 museum. One of the most amazing moments of my life to be a part of. Second episode, the script comes. And man, it just sounds like me. And I said, who, who did this script? They, whoever did this cracked my voice. They figured out like the parts I like and, they, and they, they got it. And it was Josh. And so when the show was over, this is obviously, I called him up like three years later. I had this idea for the George Washington book. I really wanted to write it. I knew I didn't have the time. I called him up. I said, I said you want to write a book? He says, I've never written a book before. I said, I've read your writing. You can write a book. He's like, I don't know how to write a book. I'm like, trust me, you can write a book. And I'm happy. I'm not right about many things in life, but I was right about that. And I, and I, I, I knew a voice when I saw it. And I knew someone who saw the world like I saw it. And every time there was a cool detail, we always agreed this was the cool detail. And it's really hard to find someone who thinks things are as equally as cool as you are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've written, you've written fiction, you've written nonfiction, and you said you've written for television. Talk a little bit about the differences between those three and then the, the things that that are common that, that you're going to use regardless of what form you're writing in. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll say it like this. So when you write a novel, right, you have your, you have your, your words and that's your palette and, and whether it's fiction or whether it's nonfiction, of course, when it's nonfiction, you also get other people's words because things happen in real life. You can ask and see what Abraham Lincoln said that day, what FDR said that day. When you write for television, I would hand in a script and then the showrunner would make some changes around the show. Then the network would ask for some changes. The studio would ask for their changes. The director would say, Hey, can we make this scene over here and change it this way? The actors would come up to me and say, Hey, Brad, I don't want my character to look like a jerk. Can we make this character a little nicer here? I don't want people to hate me. I want to be loved. Like all actors want to be loved. <laughs> and then, uh, and, and by the time the episode would air, my whole family would be gathered around the television the credit would come on the beginning of the episode written by you know my name and my friends who we write it, you know, who I wrote it with. And I would watch the episode and go, man. And I wrote the episode and I'd be like, I, I wonder what's gonna happen next. You know, <laughs> and, and 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 so that's the real difference. Otherwise, I, I actually don't see, you know, you don't obviously in television uh, and in books, I think you it's always about showing and not telling. You gotta show it and don't tell it. So you don't, you know, you don't want to have people saying, I'm scared. That's yeah. telling it. Right. What you want to do is someone could tap their you know, foot on the floor. They could, you know, bite at their fingernails. They can do all the cliche things. And sometimes you can find really good ones. And, and that doesn't change. Right. It doesn't change in TV, though. What you learn is you learn how to shut up because actors can do things with their eyes and they can do things with a look that you don't have to say a word. You don't have to even tell them to do something that's fidgety. You can just show it on their face. And if they're good enough. I'm like, you, you start erasing what you've written because you're like, this person can handle some internal thing that you really can't do anywhere else. And, and obviously with a book, the best part is, is you can show someone's thoughts. Can't do that in a screenplay. I can literally say, you know, Charlie's really nervous right now. And, or, you know, the better version of course, being like, Charlie's thinking back to first grade, you know, the first time he got in a fist fight and got beat up. And he's thinking about that day as he's walking into work and you don't need to know anything else, but you know, this is not gonna be a good day for you. Yeah, I've had that same experience with playwriting with, you know, you, an actor takes takes a line that you just put in there to move things along. And suddenly you realize, gosh, I almost didn't even need that line because she's doing it all with her face and with her, you know, uh, her performance. But And not only that, directors are incredible. I, I watched some of our scripts on our TV show. I, I remember a script came in that someone had written and I thought this is a terrible script. It just is. It's just not that great. It, it, it was full of cliches. It was just OK. Uh, and then I saw an episode that came and I was like, this script is the best script in the world. It's the best script anyone's written this entire season. This is going to be the one, uh, you know, where's our Emmy nomination? I'm ready for it. 
And they put two different directors on those shows. One of them, the best director and a guy who was just an okay director. And the okay director took that spectacular script and made it completely boring. And the incredible director took the most garbage script we had that entire season and made it our best episode. Yeah. And it showed me right there why writers get so, so little respect in Hollywood because, you know, directors can just with a touch and, you know, a couple edits and great editing can add tension to something that had no tension on the page. They can find a whole new storyline, whether you intended it or not. And that, that, that's, a, that's a real art form to me. That's a pretty amazing trick to me. Well, I have to admit, when I first saw your books lined up on the shelf at Bookmarks and I saw conspiracy, 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 I thought, uh-oh, because the word conspiracy has has kind of been co-opted in our society now. And unlike in your books, often refers to something that's not true, that didn't happen, that is completely made up. What is, why, what do you think is driving our obsession with the whole idea of secret conspiracies in in society right now whether they be real or imaginary no and listen charlie you're right i actually even asked the publisher i'm like should we change the titles because you know i don't want to be tried and say there used to be good conspiracy and now they're bad conspiracies but yeah. you know conspiracies used to be you know something we search for actual searches for truth now it's just nonsense you know there's so much nonsense on the internet you find pick any politician i don't care what side of the politic of politics you're on and the moment anything is said about the opposite side, you will believe it because you just want to believe it. We will believe anything. People will say anything. It's incredible. Both sides do it all the time. It's disgusting to me. We're using the word conspiracy as its legal term, which is a group of people getting together to plot something bad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, it has absolutely been co-opted to crazy town. Everyone with a Twitter account has their theory for everything that happens in the world, whether it has any basis in fact or not. Yeah. Um, and, and that's troubling to me. So I trust me, I we literally went to the before we published this book, we were like, maybe maybe we should call it the Nazi assassination. But we were like, oh, but, you know, we know they don't get killed. So we don't want to call it that. So we're just you know, we're trying to figure it out. But but I 100 percent agree with you. So in your prologue, you you don't quite explicitly pose this question, but you sort of hint at this question. So I'm going to pose it, it to you. What might have happened? If this conspiracy had been successful, if the Nazis had, in fact, assassinated Roosevelt, Stalin and, and Churchill that that day in Tehran. Well, uh, it's a good question, right? I mean, I'm not one of those people who feels like, man, if, if this Nazi plot was successful, we would be hanging swastikas in Times Square right now. You know, I, I like to think and maybe this is the hopeful side of me. I, I, I do believe that the war potentially could have changed greatly. I know that back then perception was reality in a way it just isn't today. I mean, back then, you know, as a better example, today, if something goes on Twitter, if I put anything out there that relates to, you know, the current president or the previous president, you know, people will immediately say, I don't believe that. That's not true. You got it wrong. No matter what, everyone's got an opinion. But back then in the 40s, when you saw it in the newspaper, that became the truth. That was how it happened. And so when Churchill and FDR meet for the first time in Morocco and Casablanca, they have this amazing summit. They say, you know, the war is going to be an unconditional surrender, meaning we are not going to negotiate with the Nazis. We're not negotiating with Japan. Winner take all. We decide what happens. The winner takes it all. They show a meeting together on the front page of every paper in the country. And it's a huge boost for the allies. Like the allies have it together. And you can feel the momentum of the war shift just from that appearance, just from that perception so to me, if you're, you know, if the Nazis who, by the time this summit is taking place is starting, things are starting to go south for them. They need a win. They don't, they're not losing by any stretch, but they need a win at this point. Starting to, they're, they're starting to get worried. You take out the big three, the height of World War II. It's an emotional shift that God knows what would have happened. But I also like to believe that there were plenty of people in our government who I hope someone would have stepped up and, and those same things would have happened. But it just it would have been in a very different way, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Are there, do you have more uh, conspiracy books in the pipeline? We do. We're working on the next one right now. I'm not talking about it just yet because we're, okay. we're still, but it, yeah, we're working on that. And, uh, and then I'm working on the sequel on the thriller side to the lightning rod, which is our, our, our main characters, Zig and Nola, are my two yeah. recurring characters. And so we did the escape artist and the lightning rod. And now those are, this will be the third book in that series. Great. Great. Well, we like to end every episode of Inside the Writer's Studio with the same 10 questions. You should be able to answer each of them in just a few words, but hopefully they'll give our readers a little, I mean, our listeners a little insight into, into writing and into your writing in particular. So if you're ready, we will begin. I'm ready. 
What word do you love to work into your writing? <laughs> uh, magical. And I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm just lying now. 69. <laughs> when, when Winston Churchill's birthday, it's his 69th birthday. I couldn't help but be like a 10-year-old boy again. <laughs> what word do you hate to encounter in other people's writing? Uh, big, obnoxious words. I, yeah. When I see a giant big word and someone's showing off that, pick, pick your big word. Yeah. Where's your favorite place to write? Anywhere with a window, though. I, I love my home office. Where could you never write? A closet without a window. My first book I wrote in it. I did write in a closet, my first book with no window. So I, that's probably not even true, but now I don't want to. Yeah. To what rule of grammar do you pay least attention? Uh, split infinitives. Good. What's the first book you remember reading? Justice League of America, number 150. Mm. What are you reading now? A book on Jesse Owens, because I'm working on a book about him. Oh, good. What book would you like to have written? Uh, I, uh, to Kill a Mockingbird. I know it's cliche, but that's the one. Yeah, yeah. No, I take it back. I take it back. Watchmen by Alan Moore. Okay, yeah. What sort of book would you like to write, but probably never will? A sports book. And finally, what would you like to hear a reader tell you? I know what I won't want them to tell me. You're the father. Um, <laughs> uh, what, so, sorry, what's the question again? What I want them to tell me? What would you want a reader to tell you? I love the book. This has been Inside the Writer's Studio. I'm your host, Charlie Lovett. And my guest today has been Brad Meltzer, whose book, The Nazi Conspiracy, is available wherever books are sold. And Brad will be here with us at Bookmarks on January 20th. Brad, thanks for joining us. Can't wait to meet everyone. Thanks so much, Charlie. Inside the Writer's Studio is sponsored by Bookmarks, a literary nonprofit that runs the largest annual book festival in the Carolinas and operates a community gathering place and nonprofit independent bookstore in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. To find out more about Bookmarks and all its programs, visit www.bookmarksnc.org. Inside the Writer's Studio is proud to be affiliated with Libro FM. Unlike other audiobook platforms, Libro FM supports your local independent bookstore. Whether you buy a single book or, like me, a monthly subscription, you can link your account to your local store or to Bookmarks to support literary community. For a special two-for-one offer, go to Libro.fm and use the discount code WRITERS. If you've enjoyed Inside the Writer's Studio, please consider leaving a rating or review online at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Inside the Writer's Studio posts new episodes on the 1st and 15th of every month. I hope while I was taking some time off for the holidays, you had a chance to catch up on some back episodes. Remember, you can find authors from Louise Penny and John Grisham to Ian McEwen, Scott Truro, Roddy Doyle, Matt Haig, Jason Mott, Chris Bojalian, Emily St. John Mandel, and even Henry Winkler, right here on Inside the Writer's Studio. On our next episode, I'll be talking to Kate Alice Marshall about her new thriller, What Lies in the Woods. Until then, thanks for listening, and may you read with wonder and write with passion. <laughs>